go live. Okay, hi everyone. So I am uh, in these pandemic times, one of the things I'm doing, which I'm finding a lot of fun, is doing general Q and A's for kids and others, but primarily kids about science and technology. So I'll try and answer whatever questions you might have. Um, let's see, I think we already have some here. Um, okay, there's a first question here, actually. What physical experiments do I recommend for kids? That is an interesting question. Um, hmm, interesting question. You know, I have to say, my own efforts at those when I was a kid were pretty lame. Um, I'm thinking about that. Um, you know, Getting intuition about how things work in physics is, uh, uh, is something I think one does from just paying attention to things going on around one. I mean, I think that the question is, you know, why did that happen? It's more, I think the, the art is more in the question one asks than in necessarily doing the thing that has an unexpected result. I mean, it's like you see something happen and you say, why? Or you see some strange technological object and you say, what is that? And why was it built that way? I mean, that's, that's been my, uh, uh, probably my, my best comment on that. Now, there are also computer experiments. There are lots of those that are fun for kids to do. Um, lots involving simple programs like cellular automata. One of the things that's neat about those is it's, it's really easy to discover stuff that uh, basically uh, nobody ever discovered before because it's sort of a wide open area that hasn't been much explored. But I don't have a, maybe I, if I think about it some more, I'll have a, I'll have a better answer to, to actual physical sort of hands-on experiments people, people can do. But I think the most, most important thing is to actually ask why did things happen and see whether you can explain that. Or why is a piece of technology built the way it's built? Why does, uh, uh, you know, wh why does that, um, uh, that, to, you know, phone have this thing set up that way. And I suppose that that extends beyond the pure science of it to things like the user experience of it. Why did they make, why is it the case that, you know, the, the buttons on a phone, the, the, the soft buttons on a phone work the way they do? Why is it, you know, tr try to understand why these things happen. And that's, uh, that's a sort of very educational thing to do. Um, Okay, so a question from PH something, uh, asking about the uh, physics project, which we just uh, launched last week, um, and the possible connection of the project to making space travel more possible. You know, that's far away. I mean, back in, you know, when Isaac Newton was inventing his universal law of gravity, the, the uh, the law that says that the gravitational force between two things is the inverse square of the distance between them. That's something that Isaac Newton uh, first came up with uh, probably in about 1665 when he was, um, when he was hanging out, um, sort of locked out of his university by a plague actually. Um, but he came up with this law of gravitation and in principle, that law of gravitation should have explained that it's possible to have artificial satellites to to launch things that can be in orbit around the Earth. But it took until, um, well, it took until the 1950s, the late 1950s, before, which was uh, a full 300 years, basically, almost 300 years, between the time when the theory for how one might launch something in orbit around the Earth to the actually launching something in orbit around the Earth happened. Now, in terms of, in terms of this physics theory, that uh, we've been working on. So one of the questions is, what does it say about things like faster than light space travel? Um, the answer is, at least in first blush, it seems to say that's hard. There's no, there's no sort of magic way to do that. But it also says that's not completely impossible. If one makes use of quantum mechanics in the right way and so on, not completely impossible. We certainly don't know. We don't know how to do it. I mean, a lot of the more exotic effects are ones that have to do with black holes. And you know, the, the, we don't have any sort of black holes available in the lab on Earth 
the nearest black hole, actually, I don't know how far away it is, maybe a thousand light years away, um, maybe a little less than that. Um, there's a big black hole at the center of our galaxy, the sort of giant garbage can of our galaxy that's, uh, that's ingesting stars and all sorts of other things. Uh, we, are, we are far away from it. We will not be ingested by the giant black hole at the center of our galaxy. But um, the, uh, uh, so, you know, some of the effects that um, this physics theory predicts or talks about are things that happen in connection with black holes, but those are not sort of readily at hand. Um, okay, there's a question here from Lexington. Do you have a suggestion for someone who finds math fascinating, wants to learn more, but is not a math whiz and has difficulty with homework and tests? Well, I don't know what a math whiz is necessarily at the at a sort of uh, a school level. I know, um, uh, I'm not sure that I, for example, was a math whiz in the sense that uh, when it Come, for example, okay, this is one of these stories one shouldn't tell to the young, but I'm going to tell it anyway. Um, you know, I didn't learn my multiplication tables until I was a full adult. And I, I perhaps had the misfortune of being in an in elementary school and I was supposed to learn multiplication tables. The uh, sort of, there were things like they had some game where all the kids would line up and they would go down the line of kids asking randomly chosen multiplication facts. And if people couldn't answer the multiplication fact would go to the next kid and the next kid and the next kid. And the first kid who could answer the multiplication fact would go to the front of the line, so to speak. And I learned that the one fact that people didn't know was what is seven times eight. So that was the one thing when I was seven years old or something that I definitively learned seven times eight is 56. But that was the only one. All the other ones, because they were randomly chosen multiplication facts, most of the other ones like five times three and things, that's easy, I can work that out. But um, you know, six times nine, things like that. I, I kind of tried to keep track of when did I need to know that? And some of those facts, I think I learned finally in my 40s or, or even older than that. Um, eventually I did learn them. I know that um, one of my kids who was uh, not into doing any kind of math at all, but was very interested in, in business, I was like, you know, he was like, why should I learn to do any mental math? And it's like, well, let's say you're trying to do some kind of business negotiation in real time. And somebody says, I'll give you 10% more for this. It's like, it's good to be able to actually work out what that means. And I think that convinced him and he got to be actually pretty good at doing those kinds of things. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, in terms of, I think there's a difference. There's different kinds of reasons that people are good at or like math. Um, some people like kind of the, the abstract elegance of math. Some people like the kind of the problem solving, I can get it faster than anybody else side of it. Uh, some people like the, you know, what you can do and figure out with math. I'm kind of suspecting from your question that you're more in the um, uh, kind of the elegant abstraction of being able to work out something really, really nice and perfect with math. I would say that, uh, uh, you know, you know, become friends with computers and start doing math with a computer and start seeing what you can discover about math with a computer. I think I, I tried to do a couple of uh, sessions ago here and, and there's a certainly a recording of it. I tried to do some, go through some sort of uh, uh, pretty uh, kind of from the school perspective, sort of elementary math questions. And it was sort of remarkable how quickly we could go sort of with a computer, particularly from the questions that you might be reasonably expected to answer in sort of elementary school math to questions where, well, people have been thinking about them for 2000 years, but nobody knows the answer yet. Um, so I think being able to sort of explore math experimentally with a computer, uh, go to our uh, cloud, you can start, pl start playing with things there. Um, that's, a, that's a good place to start. You know, I actually myself have had um, a project started about three years ago to try and write a kind of uh, introduction to the abstract ideas of math uh, sort of for everybody, but I haven't, I haven't gone, I mean, I, I got about four or five chapters in and maybe I should post what I have. I'd be interested in feedback from people who, who might find that interesting. Um, all right, next, uh, there's a question here from Hamid. How far are we from building von Neumann machines? I'm not quite sure what you mean by that, but kind of guessing what you mean is self-replicating uh, computers or self-replicating Systems. So, so one of the questions is, you know, when we see biology, one of the 
one of the sort of uh, notable features of biology is biological organisms manage to make copies of themselves. Well, at least approximate copies, you know, given, given two parents, you can make a child and the child isn't the same as their parents as, uh, as, as many people, as many children are, are, will point out to their parents. I certainly did to my parents. My children have pointed out to me, the uh, children aren't the same as parents, but they are, they're made from the same kind of, uh, they're, they're similar, so to speak. And in some organisms, there's, there's sort of directly, direct replication of, um, of, of a parent to, to child organisms. So one of the features of biology is this, this amazing capability to make a copy of an organism. And you know, it wasn't known back in, in the 1950s, uh, 1940s and early 1950s, it wasn't known how that could possibly be. How did, what was the, what was the mechanism by which an organism could make a copy of itself? And a person called John von Neumann um, tried to come up with sort of a, an elaborate kind of theory for how life might work and how things might make copies of themselves. And he came up with a very elaborate theory, um, most of which isn't really so relevant. Um, although he did sort of invent the idea that maybe it was like a program, maybe it was like a computer program. And then in 1953, the uh, DNA, the structure of DNA was, was, was decoded and it was realized that the DNA molecules that essentially all life on earth, except for RNA, some, some things only have a sort of half of DNA RNA, like the virus we're all fighting right now is an RNA virus. But, um, but basically DNA is a molecule that stores the programs for all organisms. Like for example, our DNA for humans is six billion base pairs long. So it's about, um, let's see, that means it's about three, uh, it's about three gigabytes of data. Um, did I get that right? Base pair, no, it'll be half that, 1.5 gigabytes of data um, to represent uh, one, of our, uh, one of us humans. And, and what happens, when sort of when a human is built, so to speak, what's happening is inside each of our cells, there are, uh, there's a whole molecular mechanism that's looking at that program on our DNA and actually building molecules that implement, that, that are specified by that program. And, and some of those, some of the pieces of that program will specify, you know, skin cells, hair cells, heart cells, muscle, muscle cells. Those are just different parts of the program that is specified on every cell, all the 100 trillion cells in our bodies have a copy of that piece of DNA. So it's this kind of, it's this scheme for being able to uh, replicate. And the, the way it works is um, DNA is a, a molecule which has two strands. And in order to replicate, what happens is one strand comes off and then basically another strand is formed from the uh, from the scaffolding that's created, but because these strands, each each strand has it has some uh, code that's made from these uh, uh, little little um, uh, collections of atoms, base pairs, um, A, T, G, and C, and um, they're set up so that whenever there's a, a G on one strand, there has to be a C on the corresponding strand. So if you only have one strand and you start trying to rebuild another strand, if there was a G on the first strand, you'll get a C on the second strand, and eventually you have essentially a copy of the uh, uh, copies of these, uh, essentially a, just a, a um, essentially a copy of, of one strand on the other strand. And that's, that's how you manage to replicate the molecule. So, so we've got in all of us and all life on earth, there's this idea of self-replicating molecules. Uh, we have not yet managed to make with technology anything that works as a self-replicating molecule in the way that DNA works. We're getting closer to that, but we haven't managed to do it yet. Um, and, and when people think about doing technology that involves self-replication, they usually actually think about leveraging about using what biology has already constructed using DNA and RNA and all those kinds of things. So one question is, so one thing is, can you make a self-replicating thing that isn't based on biology and isn't based on something that has come out of the history of life on earth over the last 2 billion years and so on? And the answer is we're not quite there yet, although it's clear we could do that with a molecular, it's kind of a molecular scale computer, um, but we don't yet know quite how to do it. Uh, actually, let me say something about molecular scale computers. So I mean, computers as they exist right now, you know, computers store information bit by bit. So they're, they're storing, you know, any, any data in a computer is ultimately stored in terms of uh, ones and zeros on or off, Etc. And there's just a huge array of those, and so 
you know, I think my computer has 96 gigabytes of, uh, of random access memory, which means it has about um, uh, 100 billion times eight. So um, uh, see, this is where multiplication facts come in useful. Um, so that's uh, 800 billion, nearly a trillion uh, bits of memory. Uh, each is just specifying sort of on or off and, and ultimately that's representing all of the programs and images and everything that I'm that, that are in my computer but um, uh, the um, uh, but the way the each one of those bits in my computer is represented by the presence or absence of maybe 10,000 electrons so they, that's like you know in in inside atoms there are electrons and electricity is made up of electrons and each bit in a modern computer is represented by maybe 10,000 electrons. So if there's a one, there's 10,000 electrons there. If there's a zero, they're not there. Okay, so we can ask the question, could we make a computer in which bits of information are represented one electron at a time, where we only use one electron, or we only use one atom to represent each bit of information in our computer? Well, the, the, the one problem with that, which is that uh, there tends to be, when you get down to those small scales, um, there's, there's always the kind of, um, well, there's, for example, always heat. There's always some um, uh, things, are, uh, the molecules, the atoms are not completely stationary. They're always, they're always sort of bouncing around. And as a result of that, there'll be, it's like that one electron that was supposed to be there. Well, actually, maybe something will kind of uh, just knock into it and the electron won't be there when it was supposed to be there, or there will be an electron there when it wasn't supposed to be there. There'll be little errors that creep in when you're using just a, a really tiny number of electrons to store each bit. Well, actually, there's a trick for, for but so, so, so right now, so that's one of the problems is that when we get down to trying to store, you know, one electron per bit, um, we'll be subject to all of these errors that come about through just the, the things that happen down at the scale of atoms, the sort of random motion and random processes that happen down at the scale of atoms. Okay, let me mention one trick for, um, uh, it's called error correcting codes. And it's a way of, um, uh, it's a way of, of being able to uh, be sure about data that you have. So let me give you an example. Um, the, um, so let's say that you wanted to store, um, you wanted to store a sequence of ones and zeros. And you had, let's say you were storing five ones and zeros. And so you, you might have one, zero, zero, one, one. Uh, that might be what you're trying to store, one, zero, zero, one, one, okay? But now, uh, let's say we want to check whether one of those bits was wrong. Let's say the first one might be flipped to be a zero and we're not sure. And we say that there might be an error of that kind. Well, here's the trick. So what you do is you, you just say, you look at the one, zero, one, one. What did I say? One, one, did I say five bits? Uh, oh yeah, one, zero, one, one. Uh, so then, um, then what you say is, do you have an even number of ones or an odd number of ones? If you have an odd number of ones, add an extra one at the end. If you have an even number of ones, put a zero at the end. So we have one, zero, zero, one, one, and that has an odd number of ones, so there'll be a one at the end, okay? So now, if we're looking at that group of six bits, six digits, and we see that we can then ask the question, did that bit at the end agree with, th did it correctly represent whether there were an even or an odd number of ones? If it did correctly represent it, we can have some confidence that there wasn't, we know that there couldn't have been one of those, one of those bits that was flipped, because if it had been flipped, then that last check digit should be different. Okay, so so that um, uh, so and, and um, if it if it if it's wrong, if that last bit doesn't correctly confirm the number of ones in the in the previous part, then then we know that um, uh, then we know that something went wrong, and so we can, for example, say, well, we have to uh, reread it, or we have to uh, generate some error, or something like that. So that's a that's sort of the basic idea of an error correcting code. Actually, one can do it a little bit better than that. And one can, by adding a little bit of extra data, um, by you have a bunch of data and you add a little bit of extra data, you can actually correct errors. Um, you can, for example, if you say there's only one error, there's at most one error, you can say, well, I know what, from just the check digits at the end, you can say, I know what that error is, 
and I can correct it. If there were two errors, you might be out of luck. But if, if there's only one error, you, you can correct it. So error correcting codes are really, really widely used. I'm sure as the data from my webcam through the internet to you guys is being transmitted, it's full of error correcting codes um, that are trying to um, deal with uh, things that might be bits that might be being lost in different places. Um, and uh, the, if you look at, um, I don't know, if you look at a book, do I have a book readily at hand? Um, no, I don't think I can uh, reach, uh, reach and find a book. Let's see if I can reach and find a book. Uh, here we go. Okay, here's a book. Uh, this happens to be a book I wrote, but um, that's, um, uh, so if we look back here, if we look there, that is the ISBN number, the International Standard Book Number. That's every, every book that's published gets one of those numbers that specifies it's a, it's a way of identifying which book it is. Well, uh, when ISBNs were invented, one of the things that was done was to add a check digit at the end. So if somebody were to, were to type in this ISBN number and they would get one of those numbers wrong, then that nine at the end, that's the check digit, that nine at the end wouldn't agree correctly. And so they'd know they'd typed in something wrong. Um, so that's an example of one of these error correcting codes. So that's a way that one can go, if one's trying to build like a computer out of, out of atoms, um, that's one of the important tricks one can use to try and get rid of the effects of kind of uh, sort of small, uh, small uh, perturbations, small errors that happen at the level of atoms. One of the things that's been a kind of a long running question is, okay, how would we build something that where we have like, let's say we wanted to build a little machine, a little, a little thing with gears or something, and we want to make it actually out of atoms. Um, we want to make it so that the gear teeth, so that each gear tooth is just a small number of atoms. Is that a possible thing we can do? Well, actually, if you want to know about like rotors, like something like a gear, turns out there are bacteria that actually have little flagella that are used to little propellers that they use to swim along that actually have essentially molecular sized gearing in them. Um, where the where the individual uh, uh, the individual pieces of the kind of the gear are at the scale of a, of a fairly small number of atoms. That's something that was created using the machinery of life. But the question is, can we make? And so that was something that was created from their DNA program. The molecules were created that followed that DNA program that made this kind of gear structure. So the question is, can we can we do something like that? Um, not. Uh, through DNA, not by using biological evolution um, to have created the apparatus to do it, but could we make, uh, as a piece of technology, something that will make a molecular scale machine? So the answer is not yet, but one day that will be possible. And uh, uh, you know, somebody is going to figure out how to do this. Um, see, the thing that is right, right now, when we want to build things out of molecules, the main way we do that, there are really two ways to do it. One is to use living systems and to use the fact that DNA can encode a program that can specify how certain kinds of molecules, proteins, can be built up. That's way number one. Way number two is use chemistry because a lot of chemistry is about synthesizing molecules, going from one set of molecules and saying, you know, uh, mix these two chemicals together, heat them up, stir them, stir them together, all those kinds of things. And what's happening when you do that is molecules are combining, breaking apart, all those kinds of things. And what you want to do in chemistry, chemistry is kind of the story, uh, synthetic chemistry at least, is the story of how do you go from, let's say, perhaps quite small molecules to bigger molecules that do something useful. So like molecules that can be used to, uh, to make materials one's interested in, molecules that can be made to use to make drugs one wants, those kinds of things. And that that story of kind of how do you, how do you synthesize uh, molecules is, is a story of how do you find this procedure. And, and these days, you know, there may be a 20 step procedure, maybe the biggest ones are maybe 30 steps or something, maybe 35 steps that say, do this, do that, mix these chemicals together, do this, do this, do this. And you're gradually building up this bigger and bigger molecule. It's kind of the, the, the sort of the story of, can you, can you figure out how to sort of, uh, uh, make changes to the molecule you're building up so that you get the molecule you want. That's kind of been the, the story of chemistry. But that doesn't really make molecular scale machines. That usually makes molecules that just sort of sit there 
and for example, they're a particular shape, and so they'll fit into some, some gap in some other molecule to prevent the molecule from doing something you don't want it to do, or there'll be molecules that line themselves up in a certain way, but those molecules aren't like machines. They're not, they're not like actually sort of uh, doing something at a molecular scale. They're not making something with a bunch of cogs and gears and things at a molecular scale, and we don't know how to do that yet. Um, I think, uh, I personally think that's one of these kinds of things which somebody, some clever inventor out there, is going to figure out how to start building things at a molecular scale. And I think it's going to be something where you effectively, you build yourself molecules that can act as tools, and then you build yourself ways to sort of program those little tools, and the tools will be operating at the scale of individual molecules, and they'll be sort of constructing other molecules. And gradually, you'll start off with pretty simple tools, but gradually, you'll end up building up more and more complicated molecules, and eventually, you'll be able to build these sort of molecular scale machines. Okay. So this was a sort of long answer to, um, so, so I think that's one of the really exciting things that I think is part of the future of technology is molecular scale, uh, molecular scale machines, molecular scale computers, those kinds of things. Not there yet, but, uh, but perhaps we will be. And uh, one of the features of those molecular scale machines is, well, we can expect that we'll be able to do things like what life does of being able to take a blueprint for this is a collection of molecules we want to build. Okay, now I've got a universal replicator, a, a, a machine that can be given a program. Okay, let, let me back up for a second. You know, DNA, as I mentioned, lets us build certain kinds of molecules, lets us build proteins. Proteins are made of amino acids. There are maybe 20 amino acids that are commonly used by, by the organisms on Earth. And a protein is a sequence of amino acids. So it might be, um, uh, it, the, and, the, and the, what that sequence is, is specified by the program on the DNA, by the sequence of base pairs on the DNA. And the, the neat thing about proteins is proteins make up everything. They make up you know, muscle, act, actin is, a, is, is something in muscles, or they make up uh, uh, rhodopsin for, you know, in our retinas, or they make up, um, oh gosh, I could start naming, you know, there's, there's about, in, in us humans, there's about uh, 30,000 proteins, I think, that are, that are commonly, that, that sort of are, are commonly used by us, us humans, uh, hemoglobin for our blood, or all these different kinds of, of, of things. These are all proteins. And they all are built from these same elements, these same 20 amino acids in different orders. And the, one of the neat things that proteins do is depending on the order of those amino acids, the proteins... Uh, some amino acids tend to attract each other, some tend to repel each other. The proteins will fold themselves up into really complicated patterns, and the shape of the final protein is critical to how it works. Like, for example, you know, actin is a, this long filamentary protein that's used for muscles, completely different from hemoglobin, for example, which is a, a protein that has a sort of a, a little cage in the middle of it that, uh, that likes to have iron uh, atoms in that cage, and that it, it kind of, it floats around and it sort of collects iron atoms because only an iron atom fits in that particular shape and, and structure of cage in the protein. And those iron atoms are used to, to uh, uh, a part of the transport of oxygen in our blood. So proteins, um, just by having uh, the, 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 these different um, sequences of amino acids, they end up being different shapes and they end up having different functions and they end up interacting differently with other proteins and that's kind of the story of how, how we get, how we actually operate as, as living systems is uh, we're, we're full of proteins that do things. Now, a question that you can ask is, let's say proteins are very specific kinds of molecules made from amino acids. But let's say we wanted to make uh, more arbitrary kinds of, um, uh, kinds of things out of atoms. So for example, one, one pretty versatile kind of thing is carbon. So carbon is an element. And uh, you know, one thing carbon makes is the graphite that um, you find in pencils and things. Another thing carbon makes is diamond. Those are really different. I mean, graphite is, is you know, this black looking thing that's quite soft. Diamond is this transparent uh, thing that looks, that's really hard. And those are both made for just arrangements of carbon atoms. In, in graphite, the carbon atoms are arranged in kind of sheets, each one with a little hexagonal uh, a sheet of hex hexagonal ar arrangement of atoms. In diamond, there's a particular way of, in which the atoms of, of carbon are packed together that makes them more closely packed. 
and have the very have the strength that diamond has. But both of those materials are just made from carbon atoms. And uh, not so long ago, about 30, 30 to 40 years ago, uh, another form of carbon was found called buckyballs, um, which are kind of like 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 a soccer ball. Um, they every sort of the, the joins on a soccer ball. Imagine you put carbon atoms at every join on a soccer ball. That's an example of a buckyball um, uh, made from it's it's kind of this cluster of carbon atoms, um, and that's something where there are all kinds of weird applications in nonstick frying pans and all sorts of other places for buckyballs. And, th and there are other forms of carbon, uh, things called carbon nanotubes that uh, might be really useful to make uh, uh, really good uh, wires for conducting electricity and things like that. Um, but all of these things are just carbon atoms, just arranged in different, in, in different ways. And so one of the questions is, if you just say, I want to make uh, you know, some weird shape out of carbon atoms, how do I do that? Right now, nobody knows how to do it. Uh, you know, when buckyballs were discovered, they were discovered almost by accident in uh, in soot, actually, um, where where just uh, you know carbon had been sort of arranged randomly, and some of the things happened to arranged in those kind of clusters. But it is almost certainly the case that there is a tech. Well, I'm I'm sure it's the case. There is a way of constructing it at, at an atomic scale, sort of an almost arbitrary shape out of carbon, and so. You know, you can imagine that as sort of a future for technology is these, these atomic scale things that have been constructed, even just out of carbon. But if we say, well, let's allow other materials into the, into the picture, we can say, well, how will we construct an arbitrary object? How will we just make a thing that from a program can just sort of knit together this thing made out of atoms that contains, you know, silicon, aluminum, I don't know, copper, carbon, whatever, and just sort of knit it together in arbitrary shape? We don't know how to do that yet. One day we will, um, and uh, and one day we'll be able to make it so that all these different kinds of objects that we're constructing are well. We specify how to make them, but not only that. Instead of them just being there as sort of materials that just sit there and and do nothing, um, there'll be things which can actively respond to their environment. I mean, so for example, you know, plastic, big invention of the nineteen early nineteen hundreds. I mean, plastic is these molecules that are these long polymer molecules uh, where there's, it's mostly uh, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, um, where um, uh, you've just arranged them in, um, uh, in mostly carbon and hydrogen, actually, where you've just arranged a, a long sequence of, of, of atoms that all fit together to make these very, very, very long molecules. But the long molecules don't really do anything. They just make a material that has certain properties. One can imagine a time when one could make something where there's actually a little computer operating sort of at the level of individual molecules. So your material, instead of just being a material that sits there and has mechanical properties that has a certain strength and things like that, is a material that can do all kinds of things. It could respond to, uh, uh, you know, it could respond to its environment and it could start changing color like a chameleon or something, or it could do all kinds of all kinds of strange things, uh, where it's where it's operating like a computer, but at the scale of atoms. So that's one of the one of the things in the next probably uh, I don't know fifty years or something. I think you can you can readily expect that that will be possible. I mean, I think it's the the there was a time when all the materials we had were natural materials. We had things like wood, we had things like copper, we had things where you could go into the natural world and you could just mine that material or go collect it by, by you know, chopping down a tree or something. Um, in what happened in the uh, late 1800s, early 1900s, was the first kind of synthetically created materials, which plastics were the big example. And today, you know, we're very used to synthetically made materials, materials that have been made you know, artificially, um, but we're not yet used to materials that actually compute at the level of individual atoms. And I think, in, in, in the future, it will seem like, oh, you know, really there were materials that were just static materials that didn't have computation built into the material. That will be surprising to people. Okay, looping back to the original question about von Neumann machines. So kind of the thing that came out of von Neumann's really fairly incorrect, actually, ideas about sort of how life might work was the idea that you could make a machine that would make a copy of itself. And you could imagine something as, as, as von Neumann did that was at the level of, you know, giant 
pieces of, you know, gears and things you could see and the machine would have, you know, arms that would reach in and, and do this and that and the other. Um, the, uh, um, we can also imagine, as I was sort of talking about at some length, uh, uh, machines at the level of molecules and atoms and so on that uh, could make copies of themselves. But the, the question really is, could we imagine something where a machine makes a copy of itself? And, and the answer is absolutely. Now, you know, what could we do with that? Well, actually, we are in the middle of an ugly situation where a thing is making a copy of itself, right? The, the, uh, the coronavirus is, uh, it isn't quite able to on its own make a copy of itself. Like a bacterium is able to on its own make a copy of itself. A virus cannot. A virus needs to kind of hijack our cells to make copies of itself. And so, for example, um, I think, um, uh, let's see, we probably have at this point about, uh, so, so how many copies of the coronavirus, uh, 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 the coronavirus is basically a bunch of RNA, it's a pretty small piece of RNA, it's about 29,000 base pairs, all curled up inside a, a coat um, that is, uh, uh, that sort of keeps the DNA, it keeps the RNA um, sort of uh, stable inside, because RNA, unlike DNA, is quite an unstable molecule. Um, and it, it has some, some extra little spikes on the outside. Um, but that, that little tiny thing, it's, it's what, it's maybe a hundred nanometers, a uh, um, hundred billionths of a, of, a, of a meter across. Um, that little tiny thing, um, when, when it uses our cellular apparatus, can, can make copies of itself. Um, and uh, I think last I worked out, let's see, I haven't worked this out in a while. I think it has maybe, maybe there are a hundred billion trillion copies of that virus that have now been made in the world. Um, so it's kind of a hundred, is that right? About a, a billion trillion copies of it versus our 10 billion humans and so on. And, and uh, you know, we're in the process of winning, so to speak. But that's a case where there's been a copy of that, um, uh, of that object, that virus that's been made. So you know, what people started talking about in the 1950s when, when von Neumann machines were the rage was maybe we can make spacecraft that will be self-replicating spacecraft. And so one of the ideas was, let's go put something on the moon that is a factory that can basically make copies of, let's say, the factory. Well, let's send something into space that's a spacecraft that's out, uh, you know, out in the universe and it's gonna make copies of itself. Well, it's kind of tough because you have to have material to make a copy from. And if you're in interstellar space, for example, you might have one atom Every, every cubic meter. So that's hardly a lot of stuff to make copies from. But let's say that you, uh, you arrive on your, your favorite planet, your favorite exoplanet, and you successfully land there and you're gonna say, I'm gonna make copies of myself here. Well, uh, we're certainly not there yet, but we can certainly imagine a time when it's possible. Um, I don't know whether it'll be more like, you know, making copies of a virus or more like making copies of a little sort of molecular scale object, or more like copies of making a big spacecraft. I think it's gonna be actually easier to make copies of things that are little tiny molecular scale things. Um, now, you know, is it exciting to populate the galaxy with little viruses? Not so clear. Um, it might be more exciting to do it with machines that we feel a little bit closer to, I'm, I'm not sure, but, but that's, um, uh, that's kind of, so that's a, that's a long answer to that interesting question. Um, <laughs> There's a question here. How can you connect to the internet if your mom turns off the Wi-Fi? That is a challenging, ah, uh, gosh. Well, I mean, you have a cell phone. That's, um, uh, I'll tell you how I first started using, so the, the predecessor of the internet was a thing called the ARPANET. And uh, I started using that in 1976 when I was 16 years old. Um, and uh, it was kind of a funky thing because in those days, um, every computer, there weren't very many computers on this network and every computer had a number. And I think there were 512 computers on the network. Um, and you could just, you could go uh, type into a terminal, uh, kind of like a, a uh, a computer that doesn't compute anything that's just, so you connect to the ARPANET and I'll explain how you connect it in a minute. Um, and uh, then you would simply type at O and then the number of the computer you wanted to connect to. So my favorite computer was uh, 236 
which was a computer at MIT. Um, I, I lived in England in those days, so it had to, uh, uh, that was a, a network that went through a satellite connection um, and uh, all kinds of elaborate things. Uh, but but um, back in those days, you would connect to these computers um, around the ARPANET, and there were just 512 of them. Um, and that was, and they were all specified by numbers. Okay, back in those days, how did you connect to the ARPANET? Um, well, you actually connected through phone lines, um, and those were, that was when there were only landline phones, cellular phones didn't exist yet. Um, and uh, the, um, uh, the way it worked is uh, you have a phone line and uh, you have a phone with a physical you know, receiver that you like hold up to your ear and things. And uh, there were these things called acoustic couplers, which were these things with kind of rubber uh, kind of um, uh, cups. And you literally, you put the, the phone receiver into an acoustic coupler. And if you listened, uh, and then you dial the number, and I'll explain what happened when you dialed the number. You dialed this number to connect to the ARPANET. And when, when, the, when the number picked up, this thing called the modem, modem still exists today, although they're deeply built into the, the technology stack we have, a modem would pick up and it would start making all these weird whistling noises. And um, pretty soon it would be starting, it would go, Tsh! I can't imitate it. I, I don't think I could ever have imitated it, but I, it's, it's some, it would make all kinds of weird noises. And those sounds were converted by the acoustic coupler into computer data. Um, and so it was, it was basically sending all its data just through the sound of what was on the, uh, on the phone. Um, I don't know whether you can, you can, you might be able to buy from eBay an acoustic coupler um, and uh, uh, you might be able to, that, that would be a very exotic, but of course you have to have a, a, an old landline phone. Hmm. This is, a, this is getting to be a, an archeological technology stack. Um, but uh, what, what happened when you would dial into the ARPANET, uh, there was this thing called TIPS, Terminal Interface Processors. And there were a limited number of those that um, just had phone numbers and you would dial up one of these things and it would, it would answer with its funny whistles and things. It wasn't for a human to, to call into it, it was for a computer and it would start then communicating. Back in those days, the most common speed to communicate was 300 board, which means um, 300 bits per second. So that means, uh, so that's, uh, let's see, you know, I was talking about arithmetic and now divide by eight. So that's about um, 40 uh, uh, bytes per second. So that's 40 characters per second. So that means if you were using the web through a 300 board connection, you'd be getting about 40 characters per second being, being typed out. So a, a typical line might be 80 characters long. So that means a line of text would take about two seconds to come out, really slow. Um, actually, it was interesting because back in those days, people used to say, um, it'll never be possible to send data, they used to say faster than 1200 board over uh, 1200 bits per second over telephone lines. They said, just the telephone lines aren't set up to, to do better than that. Uh, well, then people succeeded in making it go faster. They, then 9600 board was the next, um, uh, the next um, uh, real threshold. I'll tell you one funny thing. I mean, I remember once uh, um, ordering some phone connection from the phone company, uh, which was a higher speed connection or something. And um, the person came out, uh, uh, was a kind of rural place that I was, was in in those days. Um, and... Uh, uh, the, you know, the phone connection when it comes to a house in the days before modern fiber optics and things, when it came to your house, there's a big bundle of, of wires. And they usually were, I think, 96 pairs of wires. And any given uh, telephone would just connect to one of those pairs. And so the question of how do you get a higher speed pair? Well, the person came out and he just tested these different pairs. And out of the 96 pairs, he found a few that could run data at a higher speed. So who knows what had happened to the other ones? You know, some, uh, they were, you know, there was a little nick in the wire or something, but it was kind of a funny process that to find a faster connection, it was just like out of the 96 wires, a few of them will be able to go faster. But anyway, so then people used to say, oh, 9,600 board, that's the fastest you'll ever be able to transmit data over the copper wires that were the backbone of the phone network. It turns out that was, that was, uh, um, uh, that was that was beaten, and in fact, nowadays people people send data routinely at two million bits per second, 
over essentially those kinds of connections. How did that happen? Well, the answer is it happened using error correcting codes, the things I was mentioning earlier, and it happened by being able to essentially predict what kinds of ways the data would be messed up by being transmitted down these wires. So effectively what's happening is the, um, the thing that is sending the data is uh, sending various check information along with the data. And it is whenever something goes wrong, it will resend the data, for example, but it knows that certain kinds of errors will be typical to occur on those wires. And it knows kind of how to optimally, how best to, uh, to package up the data and resend it to avoid those kinds of errors. I mean, this is happening uh, in 5G telephony. There's a yet another round of this. Let me explain, okay. We're talking technology here for a minute. So um, uh, um, let's uh, uh, just, people might be curious. Cell phones, people curious, how does, okay, so somebody's asking, what's my take on 5G technology? All right, I'll, let's talk about this. Okay, so first of all, how does a cell phone work? Okay, um, what, uh, so cell phone is using radio, and what's happening is when you're talking on the cell phone or data, or you're uh, looking at the browsing the web on a, on a cell phone or something, it's sending data by radio to a cell phone tower. Well, you see these cell phone towers in different places. Sometimes they're disguised as trees. Sometimes they're on the sides of buildings and things. You'll typically see them. They'll typically have uh, these kind of rectangular uh, uh, things, which are their antennas. Um, sometimes they're just vertical, uh, uh, cylindrical vertical things. Sometimes they're, they're sort of flatter uh, rectangular things. Those are the antennas. And whenever you're using a cell phone, what it's doing is it's sending radio signals uh, back and forth to, the, to a cell tower. So one of the big tricks of cellular telephony is which cell tower are you talking to? Because there are cell fat towers dotted all over the place. And the question is, your cell phone wants to be talking to the one that, is, that it's typically nearest to. Um, and for example, if you're driving down a highway or something, your cell phone will be the, the cell tower that you're nearest to will change as you drive down the highway. And so the... Um, uh, it's, um, uh, it, it's, there's a question of how does the cell phone know that it should now connect to a different cell tower? And then when you have many cell phones connecting to one cell tower, how do they not all get mixed up? Okay, so first of all, the question of how does it know which cell tower to connect to? Roughly what's happening is your cell phone, it used to be the case in early cell phones, you could actually see the list of cell towers that it was trying to connect to. But roughly what happens is, at any moment, it's, it's sending, uh, it, well, not quite at any moment. Every so often, it will send a little ping to cell phone towers, and it will try and figure out what is the strength of the signal from different cell phone towers. Um, and that tells it roughly how close it is, how much, how easily it's going to be to communicate to a particular cell phone tower. So as you drive down the highway, um, it'll hand off from one cell phone tower to another. So it'll be, for a while, you'll be talking to this cell phone tower. Your phone will be talking to this cell phone tower. Then, then it'll get closer to another cell phone tower. It'll see that the strength of the signal from the new cell phone tower is larger than the strength of the signal from the old cell phone tower. And so it'll do a handoff to the new cell phone tower. It's a little tricky because you can get into a situation where you keep on, you know, the signal gets stronger, weaker, stronger, weaker. And then you'd be handing, you know, you'd be saying, okay, I'm handing it off to cell phone tower. Uh, two, and then it'll be back to one, back to two, back to one, and that's very inefficient and causes all kinds of problems. So you have to do some, some sort of clever engineering to prevent that happening. So the other question is, how does it know uh, your cell phone is, so, so, you know, when you tune a radio, which I think people still do, you'll hear, you know, there's some radio station that'll advertise itself as, you know, we're 99.7 megahertz, we're W, whatever it is, uh, at 99.7 megahertz. So what's happening there is your, uh, the, the radio waves that are generated by that radio station, are they are mostly uh, sort of operating at that frequency and the, 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 the data, the voice, whatever it is, um, associated with that radio station is kind of just a little wiggle on top of this wave that's coming into your radio that's coming in at a certain frequency. 
And so your radio is tuned to that frequency and then you can detect the little wiggle that is the actual data, the song, whatever else that's coming from on that from that radio station. So each radio station has a certain frequency and the each radio station is allocated that frequency and it's told you have to operate on that particular frequency and nothing but that frequency. Okay, when you have cell phones, you might have uh, hundreds of cell phones that are all trying to talk to the same cell phone tower. And in order for them to have their signals not get mixed up, each one has to be allocated a certain frequency, or at least that was the original way it was done. That was the way it was done in 1G and 2G um, telephony. Um, so the idea was, uh, I think back in those days, and it may still be true, there used to be 666 channels per cell phone tower, per cell generated by a cell phone tower. So a cell will be the region that's sort of serviced by particular antennas on a cell phone tower. And then what happens is uh, there will be, let's say 600 different frequencies that that cell phone tower can use to communicate with, uh, uh, with, the, um, uh, with, um, uh, with different cell phones. And so what has to happen is when my cell phone says, I'm gonna connect to this particular cell phone tower, uh, the cell phone tower has to tell it, or back in those days, it had to tell it, you are allocated channel number 253 out of 600. And that will be the frequency, that channel, that frequency will be the one that you use to communicate with this cell phone tower. If you're handed off to another cell phone tower, you'll get allocated another channel for that other cell phone tower, and that'll be the one you'll use for that. And so there used to be this kind of transaction where there'd be sort of this, this, this thing where the where the, the sort of the cell phone would sort of hail the cell phone tower and the cell phone tower would respond and say, okay, you're allocated this frequency, go communicate with me on this frequency. That was what happened in so-called 1G and 2G, first generation and second generation telephony. Then um, when uh, 3G came in, there was a new idea that's called, um, well, okay, actually I'm, I'm skipping, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm actually cheating here. There's, there was another idea in between. Okay, so there was a thing, uh, let's see, there was a thing called um, TDMA, time division multiplexing. Um, boy, you're, you're using my technology memory here. Okay, so first idea was allocate a different frequency for every cell phone. Second idea, the weirder idea, is uh, every second, each second is broken into, let's say, uh, a hundred different or a thousand different different um, uh, different uh, uh, different slices. So the first thousandth of the second, the second thousandth of the second, the third thousandth of the second, and so on. Each one of those is a different little time division. And the idea was that a cell phone will be allocated not just a frequency but also a time division. Or actually, it might operate on a uh, on a, a single frequency, but a different time division, and it will be saying the cell phone will be told you are operating at the thirty seventh thousandth of every second. So, in other words, the cell phone, your cell phone, is allowed to communicate at the thirty seven thousandth of a second and not at any other time. Okay, so how could that possibly work? Because after all, you're having a conversation with somebody, and you know you're hearing their voice continuously but maybe your cell phone is only sending its data in this little bin of time, this little tiny piece of time. Well, the way it works is that your, your voice is compressed. So the, your voice corresponds to, you know, you, you look at the waveform from your voice, the, the, uh, you know, the pressure wave from the sound, that co the, the microphone turns that into an electrical signal, and then it's wiggling up and down. And, you know, for my voice right now, Oh, I don't know. It'll probably be, oh, it'll be maybe a, a two hundred times. You know, most of the uh, most of the speaking that I'm doing is maybe around two hundred times a second. It'll be it'll be kind of going up and down in in intensity uh, as as recorded by the microphone. But then what you can do is to take that waveform, that that signal you get from the voice, and you can actually you can essentially take all the data associated with that signal and compress it and send it as a piece of data uh, much more quickly so that you're not spending the actual time it took to say the word hello or something. You're compressing that and sending the data associated with hello, but in a much shorter period of time. So that was another scheme for having many cell phones talk to one cell phone tower. So another scheme called CDMA, code division multiplexing, was a cleverer mathematical scheme 
um, in which basically what you do is every cell phone is allocated a certain pattern of bits that says when you have an, uh, you're kind of, kind of taking this pattern of bits and you're superimposing it on the actual, uh, the actual signal that the person is generating. And the way it's arranged is these different patterns of bits, um, they, oh gosh, how to explain. The, the, these patterns of bits uh, are such that if you try and use kind of the, the sort of cookie cutter of one pattern of bits, you will get uh, the signal associated with that pattern of bits. And you use a different cookie cutter, you'll get the signal associated with another pattern of bits. And you can just put all these patterns of bits on top of each other. And the ones that aren't meant for you will just seem like white noise, will just seem like a background, uh, sort of uh, a background of nothing. Um, and uh, only the one that's intended for you will be the one you pick out. So that's CDMA and that's that was sort of the 3G, that was the one of the big ideas of 3G uh, cell phones. Okay, um, sorry, this is a very, um, uh, um, the, um, it's a very long, long story, but okay. What is special about 5G? So, so then we got to 4G um, and that's, uh, so what's special about 5G is it's got a different idea. Uh, gosh, okay, I can explain this technology. Okay, so, so one question is, uh, in order for you to be communicating with a cell phone tower, have, do you have to be able to see the cell phone tower? In other words, if you have a radio signal, is it like a light signal? Like the, the only, you know, light will basically just go in a straight line from one place to another. So, you know, let, let's say, and, and uh, radio waves, if they are sufficiently high frequency, work that way as well. They only go, they just go in a straight line from, from the source to the receiver. So essentially, it's like it'll only work for your cell phone will only work if you can actually see physically, you know, you look out, out of the, the car window or something, can you see a cell phone tower? If yes, then your cell phone will work. If no, it won't pick up a signal. Oh, I might mention, by the way, a little, little piece of cell phone trivia. Um, one of the things, um, if you, uh, you know, they would say switch off your cell phones on, on planes, at least commercial planes, um, and uh, uh, the, um, uh, and, and you know there are arguments. People are not quite sure whether it really makes a difference to the navigation of planes. But but anyway, it seems like a safe thing to do. Um, but uh, particularly if you use private planes and things, uh, th that isn't usually a thing. Um, but one thing that happens in a, a plane, it's kind of a cruelty to cell phone situation because the cell phone is expecting to hand off from um, uh, from uh, from cell tower to cell tower. Um, like if you were going at 50 miles an hour on a highway. So there's a certain speed of handoff and so on. But if you're on a plane going at 500 miles an hour, the handoff is very different. And in fact, the cell phone will like increase its power as it tries to communicate. The cell phone signals are not directed upwards because nobody expects to be using cell phones from, um, uh, from the sky, so to speak. Um, but plus also the poor cell phone will be desperately trying to hand off signals between cell towers and everything will get very confused. I mean, when you, you know, when you have a um, uh, internet on a plane, the way that works is, uh, well, some of that is ground-based and some of it is satellite-based. Um, there's this thing usually in the tail of the plane that's a pretty big antenna, maybe that big, I don't know, something, something that big perhaps. Um, and the antenna often, um, if, it's, if it's a satellite antenna, it will actually move to, as the plane you know, moves, the, the antenna will be locked in place with gyroscopes and things to, to try and keep it so that it's actually pointing correctly at the satellite. Um, okay, anyway, but back to 5G. So, okay, so first, um, first thing about, um, um, uh, about cell phones is, does it have to be line of sight? Does it have to be the case that, you, that your cell phone can directly be in a straight line seeing the, the cell phone tower and that there are no trees in the way, there's nothing else in the way. Okay, so it turns out on the frequencies that um, cell phones usually operate around two gigahertz, things like that, um, they don't have to be per perfectly line of sight. And there are, the, um, there are things where the, um, the signal, well, you get, you get all these effects where the signal is being, um, uh, is being uh, diffracted by things and so on, and it's being, it's being turned in various ways. And you get um, uh, the signal can have um, 
uh, can have different, um, it has a, a, a so-called multipath effect where instead of going straight from point to point, there are multiple paths between you and the cell phone tower that a radio signal can travel on. So one of the mysteries of cell phones is you can be standing in exactly one place and your cell phone signal can go up and down. And that has to do typically with, with changes in something to do with the multipath transmission. And those changes can be things like humidity in the air can be changing somewhere, or some tree can be moving, or some very detailed thing can change the way that, that, um, uh, that those signals work um, and uh, uh, can lead to the thing fading out or fading in and so on. There's also another effect. Oh yeah, there's all kinds of interesting physics effects actually from cell phones of, of the nulls from, um, uh, standing waves, all, all kinds of funny things. But anyway, 5G. Okay, so 5G operates at a higher frequency typically, and it is intended to be more of a line of sight thing. But the idea is to have a larger number of kind of micro cells rather than a smaller number of big cells. Um, and, uh, the, um, and so the sort of the 5G idea is just put these sort of little micro cells for cell phones all over the place and even have it be the case that one cell phone can be using another cell phone to relay its signal. So right now, you're always going straight from your cell phone to a cell phone tower. But in 5G, you can have these multiple steps and even potentially be using other, um, other cell phones to relay things. It's kind of like the way the internet works. The internet, often you're using sort of other computers other people's computers to relay information through the internet. But um, uh, so the way 5G works in a little bit more detail, it's kind of a complicated thing. So, so one of the things that 5G really tries to do is to have it be the case. So, so normally when you have a radio transmitter, it sends radio signals in all directions. In the simplest, simplest kind of radio transmitter is a dipole antenna where the electrons are just being bouncing up and down inside a wire. And that has a certain pattern of, um, of radio signals that come out of it that is not quite the same in all directions, but it's not too different in different directions. And then people make all kinds of elaborate antennas. You know, you'll see antennas with a one main sort of spine and lots of little pieces sticking out of them. You'll find antennas with all kinds of shapes and sizes. Sometimes you'll find antennas for a while. There was a big thing in cell phones, actually, to have fractal antennas that will have these nested patterns and so on. Lots of complicated patterns of antennas. And all those different patterns have different ways of, of sending radio energy in different directions. And so, for example, when you see a parabolic dish, that's intended to be something which, which specifically sends its signal just in one direction. Okay, so, so um, one of the things is, if you're sending your signal in all directions, you know, let's say you just, you have a cell phone tower and you have a cell phone and the cell phone tower is trying to communicate with the cell phone. The cell phone tower is sending its, its cell phone, its radio signals in all directions. Most of those directions won't be relevant to communicating to your cell phone. So what if it could just send its signals specifically to your cell phone and not send signals in all directions? If it could do that, it would need to send a lot less energy to your cell phone. It would need to use a lot less energy because it's not wasting all that cell phone signal going, all that signal going in other directions. So, okay, so there's a, uh, is this explainable? Maybe. Um, so the question is, if you have, so let's say you have an antenna, like a parabolic dish. You see these dish antennas in different places. You can steer that dish. Like if you have a, a satellite, um, uh, a, a dish that is um, uh, getting satellite TV, um, it will be pointed in a very particular direction. It will be looking at a geostationary satellite. Okay, there's another tricky thing. So most satellites just go around the Earth, and a low Earth orbit satellite goes around every 90 minutes. But satellites that are about 24,000 miles out from the, from the Earth and orbiting over the equator, they, their speed of orbiting exactly matches the speed of rotation of the Earth. And so that means that those satellites sit over one spot on the Earth. So that means if, if you're getting your television or your radio from that satellite, you just have to have an antenna that points in this one direction. So if you go and look at your satellite TV dish, if you have one, you will find it is pointing up to a, a point uh, somewhat above the equator, just, just outside about 24,000 miles up. Um, it'll be pointing sort of, if you're in the US, for example, it'll be pointing down sort of to the south to, um, towards the equator and up to look at the satellite. And that dish is able to be in a fixed 
it, it's just getting signals from that one satellite in that one direction. Okay. So, and if you wanted to get signals from another satellite, you would have to, you know, use a motor, turn the satellite dish. Um, so the question is, is there a way to get signals from like a different satellite from a different direction without turning any dishes? And it turns out there is a way to do that. And it's a thing called a phased array. And it's kind of a clever technique that is uh, used a little bit of math. Maybe if I pulled up a, a notebook here, I could, I could show you, but um, let me see if I can explain it in any simple way. Um, hmm. Well, uh, not so simple. It's uh, just suffice it to say that by, by detecting, um, well, it's, it's easier when you think about sending radio waves. Usually when you send radio waves, you'll make this sort of circle. If you have a particular place, like if you have, if you have something of water, making water waves, you just, you have a surface of water, you're going, you're sort of going poke, poke, poke at the center of the pond, and you'll make this set of ripples that just go out in a circle, okay? Okay, so let's imagine you're doing that in two places. You're making poke, poke, poke in one place, you're making a bunch of ripples going out, poke, poke, poke in another place, you're making another set of ripples going out. Those ripples in the middle with inter will interfere with each other. And you'll see this pattern of interference. And actually, if you have two circular collections of ripples, you'll actually see two lines where those, where those um, circles um, interfere with each other, if I'm right. I think so, yeah. Um, well, by deciding exactly what order the, uh, the, you, uh, what the timing is for poking, poking, poking to start those ripples, you can determine what the angle that those lines, where the, where the ripples will line up to make those, those lines of interference. And that, that's more or less how phased array works, except that the, instead of poking water, you've got um, uh, electrical signals producing radio waves and so on. And that, that allows you to basically steer a radio signal by without moving anything, just by changing the electrical signals, you can steer this radio, this beam of radio energy to go in a particular direction. And that's more or less how phased arrays work. So, so then the idea is for, um, for 5G is that you're trying to essentially steer signals so that you're using, so that you're making communication from like uh, the, 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 um, the base station the thing that's like the cell phone tower and your cell phone, and you're only having the signal go in that particular um, in that particular direction. So you don't need to have nearly as much signal. But in order to find out how you make the signal go in the right direction, you have to kind of know everything about the room. So, for example, the signal might bounce off the walls of the room, and it might uh, it might go through a window in some weird way. And somehow you have to discover the 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 system has to discover sort of how to best set the radio waves up so that they will communicate correctly. And so I think what happens in the, in the current 5G uh, setup, there are these things, I think they're called pilot waves, I think that's right, um, that, are, that are basically, it's sort of a two-phase thing. You're first of all, you're sending out a bunch of radio signals and they're trying to figure out what is the environment like around you. Okay, I know what the environment is like. Now I can figure out how to set up this thing that will direct the radio energy in a very particular way. So that's kind of, that's roughly the, the idea of 5G. And it's more about point to point communication rather than, uh, you know, self, you know, one little, one little radio and, uh, you know, transmitter to another little one, and then going, uh, you know, before you get all the way to, um, uh, uh, to sort of the central backbone of the, of the network. I, I can talk about, I mean, maybe I should talk a little bit about how the internet works and things, but, but um, let's see, I, I probably, I've, I've, I've been yakking on about this for a while. Let me go back and look at, um, so I was trying to answer the question. I think I was trying to answer the question, what do you, how do you connect to the internet if your mom turns off the Wi-Fi? And somehow I got into talking about 5G here, but, but um, uh, I think, um, uh, see if you can buy the stuff to make an acoustic coupler, that would be an interesting exercise. Um, okay. Ah. Uh, Talking about deep learning here, I think that's a little sophisticated. Let me uh, maybe come back to that. Um, I want to know, but the correspondence between intelligence and comprehension. For example, dogs can't recognize themselves in the mirror, but chimps can. In humans, people used to study cranial circumferences and indication of intelligence. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Um, the question is, um, uh, can intelligence be quantified and how does that all work? You know, here's the thing. The, um, you know, 
people have these intelligence tests, IQ tests, and they, you know, they are seeing basically the main thing you learn from an IQ test is how well you do on IQ tests. And it's just like if you have, um, if you're, you know, running in a race or you're, you know, trying to run 100 meters in a certain period of time, the main thing you learn by how fast you run 100 meters is how fast you run 100 meters. How much you can generalize, you know, maybe you can say if you can run 100 meters quickly, then that mean, must mean you're fit or that must mean you have long legs or that must mean you're who knows what. Um, and similarly, uh, from, you know, from any particular thing that you test, there's a certain amount of generalization you can do. You can say, well, if you can do that IQ test, then you can do something that is very, very similar to an IQ test and so on. And so there's, there's always the question of, you know, if you want to figure out, uh, you know, who will be able to, you know, I, I, for a living, I run a company and we have a lot of very talented people and I'm always trying to figure out, you know, we have some particular project, we have some particular problem, who's going to be able to solve this problem the best? And, you know, so usually the, a good guide to that is, well, if somebody's solved a similar problem before and they've done a good job, then they'll be able to solve this new problem as well. Um, and, you know, if you had sort of the, the ratings for who'd solved every problem in the best possible way, then maybe you could use that as a more sort of scientific way to guess who'd solve a particular problem in a particular way. And it's, it's, a, um, uh, it's something where I don't think, um, you know, is there people, okay, so back in the 1930s particularly, there was this whole question of, is there a notion of a general intelligence? So in other words, people were, it was, it was used for, for example, recruiting for the military and other, other kinds of places where one's just dealing with a large number of people and it's like, okay, can you sort of sort out who should do what and what's the most efficient way to sort out who should do what? And so there was this idea that one would, you know, test the IQ, the intelligence quotient. And the quotient was, uh, you know, the average would be 100 and uh, some people who were more intelligent would get higher intelligence quotients more than 100. Um, and, and, and other people who weren't as intelligent would get lower intelligence quotients. And so there was this idea, was there a notion of general intelligence? I think it was called G often, the, the general intelligence quotient that would be sort of a, an overall scaling of, of who's able to be more intelligent than who. I think what's become clear, I mean, as a practical matter for me as somebody who watches people do, you know, achieve things and so on, I think the notion that, that there's sort of a, a a general, a single number that characterizes this is complete nonsense. Um, and, uh, but I think there's a good way to think about it actually, which is, um, uh, okay, and it has to do with actually thinking about computers and it's something we should understand from computers. So uh, one feature of computers is in the end, it doesn't so much matter what computer hardware you have, what matters is how you can program that hardware. So, you know, I'm running right now on a Mac computer, you know, but I might have a, a PC somewhere, or I might have, you know, a cell phone that has a different, uh, a different CPU, a different, it's a different computer, um, and it has different hardware. But nevertheless, when it comes to running programs, I can run the same programs on these different computers. It's just a question of how those programs are encoded for those different computers. And so if you think about that for brains and for people, you know, we all have different brains. You know, our, the, the, in fact, you know, one knows one's fingerprints are somewhat unique. The, the shape and structure of brains is much more variable than fingerprints. But, you know, the ways that there are folds and so on inside brains are very variable. Um, so we all have different brains um, and uh, in terms of our hardware. But nevertheless, the, the, the sort of the programming, the software that can exist on top of that hardware can achieve the same things, even though the hardware may be different, even though you know, one brain may have this feature that, you know, they may have a, you know, this particular piece of the brain may be larger than some other piece of the brain and so on. Turns out uh, it's likely to be the case that just like for computers, it just doesn't matter because, you know, with, with appropriate programming, you just do the same things. So then, you know, one of the questions is, uh, so, you know, people then start thinking about sort of a, you know, how can you parameterize different uh, sort of people's different performance on different kinds of things and sort of multiple intelligences of parameters of, you know, how good are you at telling uh, what other people think? How good are you at solving analytical problems? 
how good are you? I don't know whether they have this. How good are you at like creating new ideas? I don't know. Um, but anyway, so I think that there's some, uh, there's this whole question about, um, uh, so I'm, I'm, I, I just, I, I wanted to, you know, this all feeds into the whole question of like standardized testing and, you know, you go through school and you do all these tests and, um, uh, you know, how does that all work? And, um, uh, you know, the, the main reason that, um, you know, there are, uh, it doesn't make any sense for you to be doing a class where you're not going to understand everything in the class. So there's some sense of sort of testing. Are you, do you know that stuff? And, or do you know enough stuff that you'll be able to do well in this class? But then there's the kind of, you know, does the testing really mean something fundamental about, you know, you? And the answer is not really. Um, I mean, I think, you know, when it comes to things like, I don't know, the SAT or something for colleges, it's like, what does that actually mean? You know, what is the, what is correlated with uh, the, um, you know, performance in something like uh, an SAT? And I think the only thing that can be said, and I think people have tried to measure and people who create those tests have tried to measure is, you know, how well correlated is it with your success in the first year of college? Well, that's what they're trying to get. It's something which is well correlated with your success, whatever that means in the first year of college. And I'm not sure, um, and, but you know, it is, it is absolutely not something generalized beyond that. I mean, it's worth saying that, you know, I've had the good fortune to um, uh, both uh, know and, and in many cases, you know, in some cases, mentor people who've ended up being, you know, very, very successful in the world or doing very interesting things, um, being able to, uh, and it's, it's really a strange thing that there's just a great diversity in the, in the actual skills that people have and you know you can get to a really good point with a very diverse range of different kinds of skills. The, the, one of the things is always to figure out well what point are you trying to get to? You know what is the thing that is a match with your kind of skills and interests, and also happens to be a thing that one can do in the world today. I mean it's it's it, you know this is one of these challenges of of do you want to do something that the world today uh, either is, uh, has a job to do? or even better, actually values. Like for example, I've been you know, involved uh, recently in trying to find the fundamental theory of physics. Does the world value that? Well, people seem to be pretty interested. You know, could I make a living doing that? I'm not sure. I'm not sure whether anybody would, you know, if it's, if it's like, um, uh, will you pay me to find a fundamental theory of physics? I'm not completely sure that the world is set up so that that's possible. I mean, fortunately I make my living in some other way, and so I can have that as a hobby and have fun doing it. And it turns out people uh, seem to find it interesting and seem to value it, and that's great. But it's it's you know it, it, it's a it's a slightly tricky thing. Uh, so um, let's see. The um, um, uh, well, there, I was I was I wanted to talk about animal intelligence in a minute, but let's. Um, um, uh, there's a point from Diana here. So how intelligent one is comes down to how well one can understand and use one's intelligence. You know, I have to say, okay, I'm gonna give a little speechlet here um, about applying things one learns. I mean, one of the things that just drives me crazy is you'll talk to people and they'll say, you say, do you know about this? You say, well, yes, I did this course about this. Okay, so here's a question that's come up in real life that one's trying to answer that can make use of the things one learns in that course. Can the person actually you know, take the things they learned in that class and apply them to solve the problem? The answer is, so much of the time, the answer is no. And it just drives me crazy because somebody spent all that time doing this class and yet they didn't learn something, they didn't take away from it something they can then apply. And you know, I've noticed this with, with kids, for example, uh, you know, they'll do math classes and they'll learn all kinds of things. And then when it comes to, okay, let's apply what you learned about, you know, the volume of a sphere is four, four thirds pi r cubed. Let's apply that to work out, I don't know, the density of the earth, given that we know certain other information. And the concept that you could actually take the formula for the volume of a sphere, which has been learned as a matter of, you know, um, learning math and apply it to something like the earth. It's like, that doesn't connect. Or like, for example, if we were talking about, um, you know, let's say I told you that the, um, uh, the, the, the intensity of a signal from a cell phone tower 
falls off like one over r squared, one over the distance squared. You know, can you apply that to figure out, um, uh, you know, given certain uh, uh, level of noise, can you apply that to figure out how far away the cell phone can be? These are things which actually the math isn't difficult. And it's something that somebody kind of learnt in, you know, a middle school to high school level math. But can they actually apply it in a real situation? There's often this, this terrible sort of fear of, you know, can I really apply the thing I learnt? Or is there something that was just a thing I learned in school as opposed to something that I can actually apply in the real world? And I think it's a great exercise for people, you know, as you kind of experience things in the world, like, can I understand that? Can I use something I learned in school to understand that? Can I make this connection between things I learned in school and things that really happen in the world? And I think this ability to like take stuff you know um, and actually apply it to things you want to solve that's a, that's a really important skill. And I don't think that skill, it's not an intelligence skill in any definition of intelligence. It's really more just a, yes, it's possible. You can do that. It isn't the case that there's this box of stuff you learn in school, and then there's all the other stuff. And the box of stuff you learn in school is only used in school, so to speak. Um, and I think that's a, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, um, uh, I'm a, big, big believer in the sort of taking things you've learned and just applying them in, in the things you run into in life. And I, you know, I, I suppose insofar as I've been able to do a certain amount of science and technology, um, a large part of my, okay, I, I probably have two, maybe three sort of tricks sort of up my sleeve, okay? One of them, which might be a built-in thing is I have a pretty good memory. And so like the stuff I learned you know, in school 50 years ago, I still think I remember, like I could probably conjugate Latin and Greek irregular verbs, and I probably would still remember how they went, even though I haven't thought about that in probably close to 50 years. So, you know, I, and whether, whether I have a decent memory just because I was lucky in getting a decent memory, whether I have a decent memory because I've used my memory a lot, and so I, you know, remember how to remember better, I don't really know. But so that's one thing. Um, another thing is just this, you know, uh, apply knowledge from different places, learn a bunch of stuff and be able to apply knowledge from one place to other places. That's, that's something, you know, just having the sort of confidence that that will work is really a, an, an important thing. And I suppose the third, third thing is it's kind of like the choose what to do. I mean, there's one thing which is being able to do what you do. And the other thing is choosing what, what you decide to do. Like, you know, when you have that project to pick, what project do you pick? Do you project, do you pick a project? You know, how do you decide that this is a project you should do, that this is a project that's interesting, that you're going to be able to do, that you have a path to be able to do? Um, how, do you, how do you pick that? And, you know, in my own case, uh, okay, so the, one of the, the sort of weird tricks of my life, I suppose, is, um, is the following thing. And this is not necessarily, not necessarily kid applicable, although it might be, which is there are these things that I'm interested in, like let's say physics. And there are these problems in these areas. And there are problems that are kind of like the core problem of that area, like the thing that is kind of the big, the big kahuna problem of that area, the thing that, that sort of people have been saying, that's the thing we really want to solve. And they might have been saying it for 50 years or 100 years or whatever. That's the, that's the core problem of this field. Okay, so my trick is just try and solve the core problem. Don't, most people who are working in one of those fields will say, oh my gosh, the core problem, it's much too difficult to ever possibly solve. So let's work on these things that are on the outer edges that are much easier. Um, and you know, we'll make a little bit of progress on the outer edge and maybe in a long, long time we'll be able to drill into the center. But kind of my strategy tends to be just head for the center of difficulty. Just try and do the thing that is the central problem. And so what happens when you try and do that? Well, uh, sometimes, so one thing that happens is you will be asking questions where the answers, if you can answer that question, even if it's not quite the central problem, but it's something that's sort of a, 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 uh, one of the bricks that builds up the central problem, you, by, by being able to answer anything right around there, you are achieving much more than by answering something out on the periphery. Also, 
Another thing is there aren't as many people looking at the central problem because people gave up usually. People said it's too difficult. We're not going to look at this. Sometimes, and the big surprise of this physics project recently is it turns out that the central problem may not be as difficult as you thought it was and as everybody else thought it was. And then that's tremendously satisfying because you find out, as, as happened with this physics project, it's like, I thought these problems, which I've known about for 50 years, would be much harder. And they just are not. And, uh, you know, that's, that's really wonderful when that happens, although you can't count on that happening. But what, what you can count on is that if you make any progress on that central problem, it'll be important relative to progress that's being made on these more peripheral things. And so, you know, I think to me, when I, when I think about different fields or different questions, it's always like, what's the main question? What's the core question? You know, if you're, if you're doing a science project, you know, science fair project, whatever else, you know, uh, it's like, what is the core question in this area you're trying to deal with? You know, you're trying to work out, I don't know what, um, oh, I don't know, how long does some kind of, um, uh, I'm picking one where it's pretty obvious what to do, but you know, how long does some kind of um, uh, germ last on some surface or something? That, that's a bad example because it's pretty obvious what to do. But um, some other case where, where it's less obvious and where there's kind of the, um, um, where there's sort of a choice between the core problem and a peripheral problem. It's like, try and solve the core problem. And maybe you won't be able to do exactly the core problem. It'll be a little bit to the side of the core problem. But by just thinking about the core problem, you're already way ahead. And, um, you know, I think that the thing to remember is, you know, when you look at people who have been very successful in, in uh, well, particularly in more intellectual fields, I think it's particularly true, but it's true in a lot of fields. The, the question of uh, knowing kind of sort of what to try to do, understanding what the goal is, is often vastly more important than the mechanical ability to solve it. I mean, like, for example, in this, in this project to find fundamental theory of physics, um, you know, some of what's come up there, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not total, totally terrible at math kinds of things and so on. But I will tell you that the, that the math that's come up in, um, uh, in trying to figure out the fundamental theory of physics is above my level of math capability. Now, some of it is above the level of math capability of anybody right now. But there, are, there is some of the math that is definitely, uh, you know, above what I can easily do in math. Um, but nevertheless, you know, I'm deciding, I'm sort of bashing through trying to get to the answer. And I can do that math well enough to be able to get through the answer. It won't be as elegant as somebody uh, who is, is more skilled at doing that kind of math might be able to do. But by, because I know what, where I'm trying to get to, I'm, you know, I, and I sort of know enough to be able to bash through it, even though I didn't do it in the most beautiful possible way. Um, and I think that's a you know, it's, it's important to realize the, the goal is often more important and more difficult to, you know, more people, the, the set of people who um, uh, sort of picking the right goals is, is a much, is, a, is an ability in much shorter supply than mechanically being able to solve things to get to those goals. Um, and I don't, you know, I don't think it needs to be in shorter supply. It's just a question of, of, of learning to make decisions about picking out goals and figuring out, you know, I think, I think one of the things that, um, like in, in my particular line of work of, of designing uh, computational languages and things like this, a lot of what's involved and, and running companies and so on, a lot of what's involved is just making decisions about things. Um, and I think, uh, you know, it's a, uh, sometimes in school, it's not really a making decision about things kind of, uh, kind of thing that you learn. And that's a, it's a, it's a really, um, you know, being able to just sort of make decisions, not freak out about the fact, oh my gosh, I don't know how to make this decision. Just, you know, you make the decision, maybe it'll be wrong some fraction of the time. Hopefully it won't be disastrous. You keep on doing the next thing. Anyway, I, I, I think, um, uh, yeah, m m more to say about that. I'm happy to talk more about that. Okay, let's see. Um, the, uh, uh, yeah, so there's a comment here from Slayer. Darth, um, saying that one of the underlying issues is that kids are taught to pass exams rather than necessarily to, to learn things. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't emphasize enough the, the value of like learning stuff you're interested in that you're going to remember, you know, 
passing the exams, well, there are structural things in the education system where it's like you can get to the next rung of some ladder um, better by passing this exam and so on. I, you know, it's a really unfortunate that some aspects of the education system are set up that way. And it's a, you know, sometimes I think with people who are like trying really, really hard to go to the right college or the right whatever, it's like, you know, be careful what you wish for, because it may be that the selection process is actually selecting for the kinds of people for whom that will make sense. And you're not one of them. Like if you're a really creative thinker, who's really good at figuring stuff out, or you're really a great entrepreneur who's good at sort of, uh, you know, doing business and so on, then going to, um, uh, you know, then, then going to the most uh, sort of elite school or whatever that has the most intellectual stuff going on it may not be relevant um, and, or has the most kind of uh, sort of perform, perform, perform kind of attitude. If you're into that kind of thing, different story, but there's a, sometimes people are like, I really, really, really want to go to this place that's all about performance, but actually, the thing that person is best at and values most isn't that kind of performance. And so, you know, it's, it's just the wrong, wrong match. I mean, I think, you know, the thing to say, okay, this is again, an off topic thing, but I'll say it anyway, because it's some, um, uh, you know, the thing people don't understand, like about colleges, for example, people say, oh, there's this, you know, US News and World Report ranking of the top 100 colleges, whatever it is. Or it's some, um, this is like, assuming that that colleges are completely plug compatible. That is that, you know, every college is like every other college. It's just not true. You know, they have different personalities and different kinds of students who go there, different, uh, different kinds of, uh, you know, styles of, 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 of operation and so on. And I think people, you know, it's sort of the, this concept of let me go to the better one because it's higher up on that ranking um, is, is kind of not, you know, it's the better one for you, so to speak, which may not be the better one according to the slightly dubious statistical analysis that's done to make these kind of, uh, you know, one shot rankings. I mean, it's kind of like, it's almost like the intelligence story. It's like, you know, reducing the college to one number is kind of unfortunate for the college because it's kind of like, um, you know, there's this whole college with hundreds of years of history and all these different professors and all these different facilities and so on. And now you're going to reduce it to this one number of what its ranking is. And that's kind of not, not the right way to think about it, I think. Um, let's see. Um, the, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, another thing that happens, okay, I'm, I'm getting on too many uh, soapboxes here, but another thing that happens is, you know, when you're uh, in many lines of work, not all, in many lines of work in careers, what matters is to do things absolutely as well as possible. It's not that there are lines of work where it's more important to just in, the, in a fixed amount of time, get as far as you can. But there are plenty of lines of work where the real goal is, you know, do it as well as you can. Doesn't matter whether it's some, um, you know, and, and sort of partial credit isn't really a thing. It's like if you're writing a piece of software and it's like, well, I get partial credit. The thing's full of bugs and it crashes for everybody, you know, 25% of the time, but I should get 75% partial credit. That isn't really, doesn't make any sense. And I think one of the things that can happen in, you know, in school is that people will end up doing things where they're running very fast, they're doing all these classes, and they're getting sort of partial credit on everything. And that's a bad model for, for a lot of kinds of professions and so on, where but that's not what it's about. It's about, you know, can I really do a good job? Can I do that project and really make it great? Um, rather than, you know, can I do it fast enough that, you know, I get sort of almost there and I kind of get partial credit for it. And I, you know, I think the thing that, um, well, you know, different people learn in different ways, but but I always find um, uh, a lot of, for example, we have a summer camp for high school students, which we'll be doing online this year. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a very project-based camp where the kind of the idea is um, uh, do an original project. Um, and uh, I think that sort of the process of, well, first of all, the process of do something that nobody's ever done before and the process of do it as well as you can Admittedly, we have time constraints there, which is unfortunate. Um, but uh, you know, these are these are really worthwhile things to to and and uh, I wouldn't say specifically about our camp, but I mean in general, just do projects you like. I mean, like I, kind of a funny thing for me, I I did a lot of physics projects when I was a, a early teenager, 
and uh, you know you can find the results of my projects on the web now. It's kind of um, I'm kind of uh, I was actually quite proud of myself. I was reading stuff I wrote when I was like 12, 13 years old recently in the context of this fundamental physics project. And it's quite decent actually. Um, it's it's um, but you know I I did that just because I was interested in it. I didn't do that in any way for school. I didn't do that. I, I don't think anybody in any school I was at ever even saw it. Um, and uh, you know, it's something, in fact, I don't think it was seen by anybody until I put it on the web a few years ago. Um, but it's something that I found really interesting and uh, it was probably kind of educational for me. Um, and it was something that, you know, I took sort of pride in doing as well as I could. Okay. Um, uh, somebody asked the question, do I know Brian Green? Yes, I, I know him, I, I enjoy him. Um, uh, okay, question is, from AS, my kids are currently reading your book, A New Kind of Science. Is your new physics book within reach of kids? Um, high school, yes. Below that, probably no. Um, I would say pieces of, there are parts of the book that talk about kind of how these simple models work, the intrinsic character of these models that should be accessible the parts um, that are sort of, um, some parts are more kind of dealing with the, um, the existing sort of uh, uh, corpus of knowledge in physics, and those I'm afraid are, are, are probably a bit advanced. Um, I would suggest if you look at the announcement blog post that I wrote, that's kind of a, a, a good introduction to the project that I, I think should be accessible. Um, and. Uh, uh, you know, accessible maybe with a little bit of, of um, looking on the web to, to learn what some terms mean and so on. Um, okay, there's a question from an Ed here asking about, um, can I explain how particles acquire mass? I can talk about what mass is, but I don't think for here because it's a little bit complicated. Um, I think one of the things that's really exciting about this physics project is we actually sort of know I think structurally and abstractly, what mass is. Um, uh, actually, we were just you're asking, is it related to spin? Um, the answer is we were just talking about that, even on a live stream yesterday, about kind of what the origin of particle spin is. So if you're interested in that, uh, I, I, you, might, you might want to check out the recording of that. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, I think we had a question back here, which I'll try to address um, about, uh, yeah, this, this question that caused me to go into this long speech about intelligence and, and measurement of intelligence and so on, had to do with um, uh, animals and animal intelligence and so on. You know, one of the things people find fun that's sort of a science fiction thing is, you know, will we be able to communicate with extraterrestrials? I think that question is ultimately a, a badly formed question, but let's even imagine that's a question. The first sort of test case for that is, how about all the animals on the earth? Can we communicate with them? You know, if we've got, you know, if you've got a cat or a dog or something, you probably have some at least emotional level communication with, with, with the animal. Um, and uh, there used to be, for a while, there was a, a, a product that was a dog human translator that would um, would sort of listen to the um, uh, listen to the barks of different kinds of dogs and it would kind of say translate that into one of you know I don't know five or ten phrases but really those related to more or less emotional states for the dog and that's some um, so that's sort of one level of of communication but but so one question would be um, what um, how would one you know if one was trying to sort of figure out the intelligence of animals, you know, well, how about we have a discussion with the animal? We, we ask it things, you know, we see, is it, is it capable? You know, when we talk about uh, intelligence of, of computers and artificial intelligence, a pretty common thing is this thing called the Turing test, which is a question of if, if you had, uh, if you were typing in a, uh, you know, text messages to something, okay, you type your text messages, and uh, you know, uh, the question is, do you know if it's a human at the other end of the text message stream or a bot? In other words, by asking it questions, 
you can say, you know, you say things like, uh, what's your favorite color or something? It'll say some answer. You say, what's two plus two? It'll say some answer. Um, the question is, can you tell by just sort of that channel of, of text messaging, can you tell whether the thing at the other end is a human or a computer? And um, uh, it's, it's pretty hard. There aren't really, um, well, it's, there's been very slow progress in making it hard to tell. Uh, I mean, people um, actually, sometimes people use our Wolfram Alpha uh, knowledge engine as something to kind of give general knowledge to AIs that um, uh, can be used for Turing tests where you're trying to figure out is it a human or a computer at the other end. And I, I've tried a few of these things. It's kind of funny because you ask it a bunch of questions and you know, Wolfram Alpha can answer those questions, but you know that no human would be able to answer that set of rather obscure questions. So there, you nailed it. It's a computer. Um, but uh, you know, this question about can we make an AI that we can have a conversation with and not be able to tell it isn't a human, it's an interesting thing. We talk about that separately. But now you know, we're asking the question, you know, how do we communicate? So we're trying to communicate with some animal, some, uh, I don't know, a dolphin, a, um, uh, something like that. What, you know, what's our medium of communication? What um, uh, and um, you know, for example, for uh, for primates, other than us, there's um, you know chimpanzees and things. People have used sign language. They've used you know things on an iPad where you're pointing at um, at different pictures of things and so on to try and sort of form a channel of communication. And there's sort of interesting questions about how far can that get? How sophisticated can the language get? Um, and uh, how sophisticated can the concepts get? One of the challenges is, uh, you know, uh, there's a famous philosopher, uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein, who was like, if you could talk to lions, what would you talk to them about? In other words, the life of a lion is different from the life of a person. They have different kinds of experiences. they are different kinds of things they care about. What would be the common themes that you could actually talk about? What would be the... Um, uh, what would be kind of the, um, uh, the 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 medium of discussion? You know, would the language would would the lion be able to form linguistic structures like we do? You know, all human languages have nouns and verbs and adjectives, all of them. Now we don't know whether that's because that's how our brains are built, or whether that's because they all sort of evolved in some some correlated way. It's not completely clear. We don't know whether that's because of something to do with the way that we think about the structure of knowledge in the world. Um, I, I could talk about this at considerable length because I've thought about it a lot. Um, but but you know the question of for your average animal, would its language have the same structure or not? Um, I'm kind of led to um, uh, and, and this question of sort of. What's the internal state of the animal? Does it have a sort of a, a model of the world that's like ours? Does it figure things out the way we figure things out about the world? Hard to know. It's, uh, you know. it's hard to know whether another person figures things out the same way you figure things out. But the best you've got in, figure, in, in learning that is talking to them and being able to ask them questions and sort of being able to sort of probe the shape of their kind of, um, uh, of their way of thinking about things. You know, I have to tell you, Excuse me. Um, many years ago, I was involved in a very silly project. So actually, many, many years ago, I was, uh, for some reason, was trying to uh, come up with silly inventions that you might file patents for and things like this. And I had two silly inventions at that time. One of them was an alarm clock that would decide when to wake you up based on looking at your brain waves. And the other was video games for pets. So amusingly, the the uh, the brainwave alarm clock thing—it hasn't been—it's not with brainwaves, but there are now alarm clocks that uh, you know sense your motion and things when you're asleep to decide what what cycle of sleep you're in and whether that's a good one to wake you up in. So so that pseudo invention eventually happened. But the other one, um, video games for pets. Maybe five or six years ago, we were working with some company that was interested in kind of um, uh, innovation and so on, and I I was actually a little frustrated and I. I eventually said, look, you know, let me feed you an innovation, video games for pets. So there was a branding company. So they were very, very interested in that. And so we started seriously looking at um, um, 
how would you make really good video games for pets? And actually I had a, I guess it was, was longer ago than that because it was right around the time the iPad came out. It was probably 2010 or so. Um, and uh, the, um, so one of my challenges was, could you invent a game for the iPad that a cat could win against its owner? So, you know, cats are quick, you know, cats are, you know, have various characteristics. Humans have various characteristics too. Can you make a game on an iPad that a cat can win against its owner? So we got uh, an animal behavior expert involved in this and um, uh, started looking at it. He said, problem is cats aren't gonna be interested. I said, what about dogs? Problem is dogs aren't gonna be interested. They're, they're um, uh, you know, they're, they're more, um, uh, and, uh, no, the problem is dogs don't have good enough eyesight and things and they, you know, they're more, uh, smell related and so on. And um, uh, so it's not gonna work for dogs. But he was really pushing the idea of cockatoos, which are social birds and uh, which are often kept one at a time. And so what this really turned into was essentially a Twitter for cockatoos project um, of, a, of a, you know, make the social network for the cockatoos. And, and you know, there were all these questions like, well, we discovered that the, the claws of a cat couldn't scratch the screen of an iPad. And I think the beak of a cockatoo could activate the screen and so on. Unfortunately, this project never happened. Somebody should really do this project. Um, but one of the things that I was particularly interested in with that project is if you give, let's say cockatoos, a means of constructing things, you know, a, a Minecraft for cockatoos or something, what would they construct? And would they construct something that you know might look completely random to us, but it might be deeply meaningful to themselves or another cockatoo for that matter. And you know what would what would the animal build if you gave the animal a means to build things? And uh, unfortunately, we never did that project. I I'm hoping somebody will eventually do that, and we'll be able to see what is the what is the great literature of uh, you know of the lions or the cockatoos or whatever else because we don't know. Now we may be in a situation where we look at it and it's like this was just a bunch of random bits. You know, this was, is this really a Minecraft? You know, what did they make? It's just something totally random. We as humans just don't understand the significance of it at all. We might be in that situation. Um, I think another thing that I've also been waiting for is, um, you know, when do we get to talk to the animals? You know, when I was a kid, there were these Dr. Doolittle books about this uh, veterinarian who talked to animals that were kind of cool. And it's a question is, okay, why can't we talk to animals? Well, one question is, do we actually have a common set of things to talk to them about? But imagine we could make sort of the universal translator where we say, um, uh, you know, um, tell me what kind of, what your favorite kind of cat food is or more, uh, tell me why you like uh, a red ball of wool more than you like a black ball of wool, okay? And let's say we could communicate that and it would turn into a, you know, meow, purr, whatever thing for a cat or, or whatever it is. Um, and, and then the cat would respond with a, you know, whatever the cat responds with, or maybe the cat would respond with some gesture with its paw or something. Um, or maybe the cat would respond on an iPad by, you know, moving things around. The question is, can we, you know, what can we detect about, you know, could we, could we learn that language? You know, it's like, like we've tried to learn, you know, people will go into, you know, the, the middle of the Amazon jungle where there are maybe still some tribes that haven't had contact with the outside world. Um, and, you know, it's like, can you learn the language of this tribe? Well, you know, it's kind of like, well, you learn it because they point at, you know, there are these things actually as a, as a um, when, you, when you do linguistics, there are maybe 7,000 languages that are still extant around the world, maybe, maybe 10,000. And there's, there's often, there's things called Swadesh lists, which are kind of lists of very basic words like person, fish, you know, these tree, this kind of thing that are um, a limited set of words that one knows in lots of languages. And where imagine you were sort of plopped down um, and you're tr sort of trying to find a way to communicate. You can point at the thing and it's like, you say tree, that's a tree. Okay, so, you know, how do you, how do you make the same kind of, um, uh, you know, you, you, you can do this with, with humans. People have done this many times of sort of learning, being plopped down in some place and learning the local language, so to speak. You know, could we learn the local language of the animals? 
um, you know, I, I have to say, I've sort of thought that with modern machine learning and so on, it might be possible. Um, and, uh, you know, you, you basically sort of record the environment of the animal, you record how it responds to different kinds of things, and you, you kind of then detect what is its uh, sort of vocalization of, of things based on what it's seen. I mean, I think one of the cases of this is, is, is whale songs. You know, whales have these long, elaborate sort of sounds that, that they make that get transmitted through the deep ocean. And in the deep ocean, sort of it's a paradoxical thing, but sound travels a long way in the deep ocean. So you can have one whale is kind of having a conversation with a whale a thousand miles away. Or is it having a conversation? We don't know for sure. We don't know whether you know, the kind of whale songs that are made are actually transmitting information, you know, being, you know, maybe they're telling the, the epic of the, um, uh, I was going to say the, the uh, I wouldn't be a good thing to say, the epic of Moby Dick or something. You know, maybe they're saying some, you know, maybe they're reciting a whale epic to some other whale that's then gonna re-recite that whale epic to other whales. And that that's been going on, you know, across, you know, halfway across the Pacific Ocean for a long time. We don't know. That might well have been happening. Uh, just like songbirds are continually making songs which other birds respond to. You know, are those songs meaningful in conveying information in the way that we think about information? Or are they just uh, purely, you know, like, like um, I will admit that I sometimes whistle when I work. And I'm quite sure that my whistling conveys no useful information and is quite horribly tuneless too. Um, and uh, you know, maybe that's what the birds are doing. They're just hanging out, whistling as they, as they hang out, so to speak. Or maybe that's sort of actually meaningful information. How do you tell? You know, how do you tell like, um, you know, and, and maybe the way you tell is you try and correlate something that happened to one bird or some environment that one bird is in. You try and say, is that environment affecting the, the, the bird song, is it affecting the whale song? Can we determine that effect? Can we maybe use machine learning to learn the effect of something and how that is vocalized by that, by that critter? And if we could do that, maybe we could learn something where, where we could be able to either decode what the creature saw or is talking about, or even be able to tell it like another one of its species would tell it something. So it's kind of a, you know, could we imagine making sort of the universal translator for, for creatures? Um, I think it's an interesting question and I don't think it's hopeless. And it's again, it's actually in the, in the spectrum of things people have tried to do or not tried to do. I don't think anybody's tried to do that for a very, very long time, if ever, and probably not with modern techniques and so on. And it might not be that hard or it might be, might be. The other possibility is you might find out that it's essentially impossible because those critters kind of worldviews and models of the world are just so completely different from ours that meaningful sort of uh, uh, serious communication isn't actually possible. Okay, we should wrap up soon here, but let me just look at... Um, uh, um, okay, Jai J is asking, what role did I play in my own kids' education? Um, uh, some of my kids don't like me talking about them, but I'll tell you a little bit. Okay, so I have four kids. Uh, the oldest is, uh, well, they range from the early 20s down to the mid-teens. Um, so um, uh, my, my, um, uh, my top three, oldest three children did a whole bunch of homeschooling. And that mostly consisted of, particularly for my oldest son, of... Um, uh, kind of, um, uh, he decided stuff he wanted to learn about. And then he would, uh, he actually got into doing kind of the whole cycle of, you know, write ad and Craigslist for teacher about such and such, read resumes, you know, talk to teachers, pick one, uh, you know, then learn about some subject. So he had the, the sort of good fortune, I suppose, to, um, uh, to just learn about stuff he wanted to learn about. And I was like, um, I wondered whether it would sort of gradually fill in and he would learn about sort of everything that was, that was sort of in the, uh, point out to him, look, here's the encyclopedia, you know, let's pick a random volume, um, you know, is there something interesting in this volume? And actually the interesting thing was he increasingly was that, oh, that's kind of interesting. Oh, that's kind of interesting about sort of everything in, in, in all these different volumes. Um, and so 
that's um, uh, and my um, uh, gosh, um, I would say um, my older daughter is a is a math graduate student, so I suppose that's a that's a mathy thing. Although she used to say that her her um, her act of teenage rebellion was to know nothing about computers. Um, although uh, I later learnt that um, she knew a lot more than she she'd let on, and um, uh, part of the explanation she was uh, did online high school, um, and um, uh, she was keen to travel, and so would um, uh, I hadn't been traveling for a long time, and she sort of said, "You get all these invitations to all over the world, you know. Let me pick the ones that um, uh, uh, are worth going to, and uh, and then she'll come along." And so she did that, and um, her eventual explanation for how she knows more than one would think she would know is, do you know how many incredibly boring lectures that you've given in weird countries around the world I've been sitting at the back at doing something else? You know, I did absorb a certain amount of stuff there. Um, and uh, then I have a, a son who has a little bit more of a public profile, Christopher, who um, uh, has, um, is a very uh, capable, um, computational person who um, uh, I reckon is about twice as fast at programming in Wolfram language as I am right now and kind of uses it. It's sort of, a, he's an interesting, um, um, uh, you can go look at his website. I think it's just ChristopherWolfram.com. Um, and uh, uh, he just does projects with computation all the time. And, um, uh, uh, you know, the thing that is interesting to see is I know right now he's doing something about uh, uh, Babylonian history actually, um, and uh, was doing some other stuff to do with the pandemic and modeling that. But for him, it's just like he knows this computational stuff well enough that he can just you know open up a notebook and he is typing code and doing things and doing things that are like, well, nobody in these fields was able to do that before because they didn't have that fluency with computational tools. So um, uh, he's um, an example where um, uh, uh, it was sort of interesting in his case, I, th I, think, um, I think I'm allowed to tell the story, um, where you know, he became a very capable computational person long before he would learn math and things like that. And he, he would say for a long time, I'm, I'm not gonna learn this math stuff. You know, why do I need to know how to do all this math stuff? Look, I can just type it into a computer and it'll do it. And um, uh, then I remember when he was quite young, I remember, remember it was like, I'm trying to persuade him to, um, uh, to learn how to do multiplication, uh, maybe even addition of, lo of not long numbers and things. And he's like, why do I need to know how to do this? You know, I just type it into the computer, it'll do it. So eventually I, I was saying to him, um, you know, well, aren't you at least curious how the computer does it? So yes, he was curious about that. But he says, but I bet it's not gonna do it the same way I'm gonna do it as a person. And so then, you know, I, I suppose this is a specific to me kind of thing. He was like, let's go look at the source code of, you know, let's go look at the code and see how it actually works. And of course, it's incredibly complicated and it doesn't do it in anything like the way that, um, that humans do it. Um, and uh, so it was like, well, look, I'm, you know, that's it's very unconvincing. Um, you, you know, you're, um, uh, but look, I think, I think, um, uh, yeah, anyway, so, so Christopher was for a while a, a pure play example of a kid who knew computation well, but didn't know things like math. And, um, you know, there was a particularly amusing case where he invented an algorithm, which actually is used in Wolfram language now uh, for doing nearest neighbor finding, um, which is a pretty mathy algorithm. And, you know, so it was like he was explaining this thing to people and people would say, oh, that's an interesting use of this math thing and that thing. And he's like, that's not math, that's just obvious. And, um, uh, you know, in, in, in the end, sort of, uh, you know, he had learnt computation, but had le not learnt traditional math. And, uh, you know, he could sort of write down the differential equations for some physical system, but hadn't the slightest idea how to solve even the simplest differential equation himself as a human. Um, and that was... Uh, uh, but unfortunately, he's no longer so pure play because he did learn uh, uh, sort of human human based math, um, uh, which is sort of sort of spoils the effect. Um, but um, you know, look, I would say another thing about my kids is that um, uh, one thing that's probably meta useful, perhaps, 
is that um, perhaps one of the more educational things they've seen is, you know, they know about projects I've done and uh, they'll know about, you know, they'll hear about these projects I'm doing and they'll, you know, know about them. They'll have opinions about them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And often it'll go from a project where they're saying, well, like the physics project is a good example. My, my kids were very unconvinced about that project for, for quite a while. And, um, uh, and then, um, uh, you know, it's sort of interesting for, for anyone and uh, one's kids in particular to see these things that go from, it's just an idea to, oh, it's a real thing that actually exists in the world and so on. And I think that, that going, you know, being able to see that one could have an idea and it would turn into something real is a really important sort of thing to know. And I, I know, well, I suppose, I mean, I, I don't know what's the nature, nurture, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, but all of my kids are very much in the, I'll have an idea and I'll turn it into something real. Um, so it's um, uh, in, in very different domains, but, but um, um, the, um, uh, I think, um, uh, that's a. I mean, one of the things that I find I find um, uh, sort of um, uh, really odd sometimes with kids is that you say, "Oh, what do your parents do?" I say, "Oh, I don't know. They're kind of uh, like my um, youngest uh, uh, child was just relating some story about some somebody that um, said the person was saying, "Oh, their 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 dad is a CEO." So my my kid had asked, um, you know, what is the company that they're the CEO of? What does it do? And the kid was like, well, I don't really know. Okay. But the, the thing is, you know, knowing what one's parents do is, it's a great data point. It's like, you know, your parents probably fairly well, and you can see what they do. And you can see what works, what doesn't work. You know, how maybe the mistakes they make, the things you think are totally goofy, the, uh, the things that look kind of interesting, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's, it's, it's really good data. Of course, you might ask, you might be asking, what did my parents do? Um, and uh, okay, so, um, uh, um, the, uh, so my, my father um, was, uh, ran a business, which in its day was, <laughs> Well, he started it, uh, kind of got into it um, right after World War II, and it was an import-export business in England uh, uh, dealing with textiles. Well, at that time, being an import-export business dealing with textiles was kind of like a high-tech, leading-edge kind of thing. Roll the clock forward 50 years, and it's not quite so high-tech or quite so leading-edge. And so I would always be quite dismissive of, of the kind of... Um, you know, oh, it's it's kind of an old, 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 boring kind of business. But but um, he he ran it for about 50, about fifty years actually, um, and uh, uh, and then on the side he wrote novels, um, and uh, which I am embarrassed to say I didn't read until quite recently, and uh, it's one of my uh, poor poor child behavior type type of um, uh, poor child performance. Um, uh, things is that, uh, but I, I, you know, to be fair, I'm not sure that my kids have read, read books that I've written. So, so maybe it's just the way of the the way of the world. Um, but uh, then my my mother uh, was a philosophy professor in Oxford, um, and uh, she, um, I, I actually have read at least one book she wrote uh, about philosophical logic. And you know, one of the things about having a philosophy professor as a parent is. Um, uh, well, one of the things I always used to say when I was a kid is if there's one thing I'll never do when I'm grown up, it's do philosophy. And yet I've ended up doing a lot of things that sort of uh, amount to philosophy. Um, I think uh, one story I kind of like to tell, I remember I was at some, some party that uh, I was sort of, um, uh, I think that was the, um, uh, you know, the child, child minding of the five or six year old me was bring them along to some some random uh, philosopher party or something and i was um uh you know of course the only kid there and there was some white-haired old philosopher who came over to me and started this long conversation with me and you know i have to say it reminds me because i've been at parties 
where I'm like, oh, these adults, they're, they're so-so, but there's some kid over in the corner. Let me go talk to the kid because that'll be more interesting. Um, and I, I suspect that's what kind of happened in this case. But anyway, I have this long conversation with this chap and um, uh, afterwards it's, um, you know, he's sort of walking away and he's kind of mumbling and he's saying, one day that child will be a philosopher, but it may take a while. And, uh, you know, yes, it probably took um, many, many decades after that time uh, before I, I got involved in those kinds of things. But I thought that was kind of amusing. I mean, I think that the, um, uh, the thing that um, uh, it's, um, um, I, uh, yeah, it, anyway, that, that's, um, uh, so that's, uh, and, and yes, I did know what my uh, parents did. And um, I would uh, sort of, um, I would hear the, um, the philosophy, I think my mother actually used to try out sort of when I was, uh, you know, six, seven years old and things would try out these questions that um, were for philosophy undergraduates would try them out on me. Although that wasn't, I didn't know that was what was going on. Um, but I think that was, um, uh, so that was, um, if I'd known that I probably would have been more amused by the whole thing um, than it's like me just saying, it's obvious that whatever, 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 whatever. Um, and, um, uh, because uh, I would always be like, look, it's obvious, you can just work this out in this and this and this way. I, I didn't really realize until long afterwards that probably those things which I was saying, it's obvious that whatever, uh, not everybody might have, you know, untangled them in those ways and so on. I mean, I think that, um, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, if, if you're curious in, in um, um, the, uh, um, the thing that, um, yeah, I mean, you know, people are saying, uh, wish their parents had told them more about their jobs. Just ask, just show interest. Your parents will appreciate it. Well, speaking as a parent of, you know, when my kids decide that something I'm doing is actually interesting, it's like, that's really cool. Um, and of course they often have, um, uh, they often have opinions um, about, you know, that's a waste of time, that's a good idea, whatever. They're quite often right, actually. Um, the, uh, uh, I think, um, um, you know, it, it's, uh, I, I, for some reason, people, I think people get into the point of view where it's like, well, I've been a kid for 15 years and, you know, I didn't find out about what my parents do. Why am I asking them today? Well, find an excuse. Because just because when you were five years old, it didn't make sense to find out what your, you know, parent who's a, a you know financial engineer does or something like this it doesn't mean that it doesn't make sense you know when you're 15 years old and um, uh, you might actually find that your parents know things that are sort of worth knowing so to speak I mean I think that um, uh, um, I mean I think one of the things with with my kids is um, they know a lot of stuff that I think is interesting and so I'm always asking them things about stuff that they know about. And occasionally they'll ask me things about stuff I know about. Um, and I think it's kind of the, the very fact that I'm asking them about things that they know about is probably why, uh, you know, otherwise they'd never think to ask me about what I know about probably. Um, and I also, look, I, I think that, um, uh, you know, one thing probably with my kids is it's like, I'm probably, about as like, just um, go try and do that. Sure, why not? Maybe people would say it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's crazy, but sure, why don't you try and do it? It's, um, and usually it works out. And, and that my, my oldest son who got into business very, very young, uh, did that uh, a, a, a bunch with him and it, it um, uh, worked out really well. And um, actually you'll probably find if you go look on the web, my son, Christopher, I don't think he's completely disowned this one. He was probably, oh, I don't know what, 11 maybe? Um, the, uh, we were going to, um, I was going to uh, uh, make a fair uh, uh, event and I was supposed to be giving some talk there. And um, he says, what are you gonna talk about? So I tell him, he says, that's totally boring. You know, people are just gonna fall asleep. That's just a total lose. So it was like, okay, well, maybe you should give the talk instead. So he said, well, maybe, maybe. And then, so eventually he was like, sure, you know, I'll do it. 
And he was, it was a time when the first um, drones, first quadricopter drones and things were available. And he decided he would do something because it was a maker type event, do something where it's like programming a, um, you know, doing real time programming of, um, of one of these drones. And so I'm like, okay, you know, do make sure you've tested it. You know, anything that can go wrong with an audience will go wrong. And so it's like, I don't know, four or 500 people there or something. And so he's like, it tries it out. And of course, something goes wrong. And so he's doing kind of real time debugging. And, and there, there are videos of this. I haven't watched one, but, but, um, uh, and it was, it was, I was, the thing I was most impressed by was how, how calm he managed to be just like, okay, I'm going to debug this, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I thought it was, I, I thought it was going to be hopeless. And it wasn't going to work. And it was, it was all, but eventually up, oh, it worked. Drone took off, flew around. And that uh, was quite, quite a, quite a cool event. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, exactly where the, um, the, uh, um, Look, I admit that the uh, doing real-time demos in front of audiences, which is something I've done for a long time, is one of those Apple of the next generation doesn't fall far away from the tree type of thing. Although maybe it's also because like he'd seen me do that a bunch of times that he figured, look, if, the, if, that, if that slow old, old fogey can do it, then um, uh, the bright young ones should be able to do it too. Um, okay, let's see. I think we should probably... Um, uh, try to um, uh, wrap up there. Um, well, it's, um, sorry, you got me off talking on about some all sorts of, of, of weird topics. Um, fun for me. Uh, I've, uh, this is, um, um, uh, I can see that during the time I was talking to you guy, you guys, hundreds of emails came in, many of them about my day job, Many of them also about physics projects. So uh, I've got um, I've got my work cut out here. But anyway, it's uh, it's been fun to uh, to talk to you guys, and uh, look forward to doing this again. And um, uh, thanks for being here. And uh, goodbye. Have good weekends.